So I'm going to share my presentation with you all. Um, if I can find it, technology. Uh, there we go. Okay, so. So for um, those of you that don't know um, Outside In, we are a national arts charity that supports artists facing various barriers to the art world. So that can be for reasons like um, physical health issues, mental health issues, social circumstance, disability. Um, and uh, we do that through a number of our programmes, um, including our artist development programme, which supports artists to um, create uh, a gallery on our website and take up our opportunities through that. Um, they also have the chance to talk about their work um, at our share art events and also be involved in what the charity does from um, a very kind of involved level through our ambassadors program and our artist advisory group and we also have our exhibitions program which is um, our program of exhibitions residencies and commission opportunities um, and then finally we have our training program which is called step up and that's our training and professional development program for artists. And that's focused around very practical kind of art sector specific skills like curating, researching, running workshops, that kind of thing. So we were very lucky uh, last year to receive uh, two years worth of funding from the Heritage Lottery Fund to deliver um, a nationwide project focusing on collections of patient created artwork. Um, and the project developed out of um, our history of working with collections of patient artwork. So um, collections like uh, the Welcome Collections, Adamson Collection, then collection a lot of times, and um, the Wardry Collection in Chichester as well. So bringing our artists together with these collections to think about key issues like um, cataloguing, interpretation, and really thinking about who has the uh, authority to be interpreting these works you know is it is it up to medical professionals is it art historians or are artists who have their own lived experience of mental health issues can they be experts in this area and we definitely believe that they can and that's kind of what our work with these collections has focused on so for this project, we are working with three um, organisations across the UK. So that's the Mental Health Museum in Wakefield, Glenside Hospital Museum in Bristol, and the Art Extraordinary Collection, um, which is looked after by Glasgow Museums. And at each of those um, venues, we are going to be running two of our Exploring Collections courses. So our Exploring Collections courses focus on researching and responding to collections um, so participants will be equipped with those skills in researching um, and responding in some kind of creative way that could be visually it could be through um, audio or um, the written word um, so we'll be running two of those courses and then following those courses we'll be delivering um, one of our new curating exhibition courses at each of those venues so that will look at kind of very uh, practical skills around putting together an exhibition, like thinking about um, how you might hang the exhibition, um, what things you need to think about, like wall labels, but it will also cover things like what story you want to tell with that exhibition. So thinking about the narrative and how you want to interpret the exhibition and how you want the audience to see that exhibition. And so that, that course will lead into um, an exhibition at each of the venues which will bring together works made by participants of the Exploring Collections courses um, and works from each of those collections. And it will be curated by people who've taken part in that curating exhibitions course. Um, and the exhibitions we're planning on um, organising for spring 2022, so that will be next year. So just to cover a bit of the um, practicalities of this course, um, so it's going to be delivered on Zoom um, due to global circumstances. Um, so we're going to be running it um, across five weeks and there'll be two three hour sessions a week for five weeks. And there'll be plenty of breaks in there as well because we know that Zoom can be um, very exhausting. 
Um, so we're going to make sure lots of breaks are scheduled in. There can be up to seven participants on the course. Um, so you'll be there with um, six other people and the course tutor and staff from the museum as well. And it will provide an introduction to the collection um, and then you'll be encouraged to kind of choose an area of interest. So that might be a particular artwork or a particular artist or a theme. And then you'll be encouraged to kind of explore that area and then respond to it in a visual way or audio, multimedia, written, however you feel you can relate to that work. And then once the course is over, you'll be, um, we'll talk to you a bit more about the curating exhibitions course and there's the opportunity to take part in that as well. So these are the, the dates the course is happening. Um, and if you do want to apply, we would say, we would really prefer you to be able to make all of those sessions. But obviously we know things can crop up at the last minute, so we can discuss those if there are any kind of clashes. But ideally, if you're available for all of those sessions, that would be great. And what I'm gonna do at the end of my presentation is put a couple of links into the chat box that will just, um, be places to go for more information, to download an application form, and where you can get these dates um, in the brief as well. So we've got um, a few important dates um, coming up. So next Monday and Tuesday, the 25th and 26th of January, we are going to be running some one-to-one -one artist support sessions. For anyone who needs um, some extra help applying for the course, um, or anyone who does not yet have an outside in gallery on our website and would like some help to do that. Um, so there'll be one hour long sessions and um, I'm gonna put information on how to book those in the chat as well. So if you're interested in that, um, I'll put Hannah's email address and you can email her to book one of those sessions. The, the deadline for applications for this course is 9 a.m. on Friday the 29th of January. Um, so I think that's just over two weeks is it we've got left just over a week, week and a bit. Um, and then we'll be interviewing on Zoom on the 9th um, and 11th of February. Um, so we use the word interview, but I just kind of want to stress that we don't mean a formal interview, like a job interview or something like that. It's really a chance for um, us to get to know you a bit better and for you to ask any questions, um, meet the team, um, just, so, just to make it a bit more personable rather than having just kind of a paper application form. So the next steps, if you're um, interested after today's session, um, you can apply to the course if you meet um, outside in's criteria. So if you consider yourself to be facing some kind of barrier to the art world, um, so that can be for reasons including health, disability or social circumstance. Um, and you will also, and this is a requirement of our funding, um, you will also need to live in Wakefield or the surrounding areas. And we're basically, as a kind of marker for location, we're saying if under more normal circumstances, you would be able to travel to the course if it were taking place at the museum, then you're very welcome and encouraged to apply. Obviously, we don't expect you to physically be able to travel to the museum, but you know, theoretically, if you could travel there to take part in the course, then, then you would be eligible to apply. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to put now um, a couple of links in the chat box um, and a couple of email addresses um, of people to contact for further information. Um, so yeah, my email address is there and my number and I'm also going to put that in the chat box. But without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my presentation now and pass over to Jane, who's going to talk to us about the collection a bit more. Hi everyone. Hello. Um, it's really good to meet you all virtually. Um, I'm the curator at the um, Mental Health Museum in Wakefield and um, I'm just going to see if I can do the technology bit first. So this could be where it all falls down. Share. And Um, slideshow. Yay! Got it up there. Fantastic. Um, can everyone see that? Great, great. So, um, 
just to give you a bit of background to um, I started at the um, museum working one day a week in September so it's been um, a strange time to start um, but it's a, a fabulous place and um, it's a, a fantastic opportunity to to work with a really really special collection um, so the story of the of the museum was um, it was established in 1975 um, when the it was part of the Stanley Royd Hospital and um, the collection is quite a unique one. It sort of represents the evolution of mental health care um, from the early treatments um, to the present day with some ob objects dating right back to the 1600s and Many places around the country don't have these um, collections anymore um, and they've been sort of lost forever. But in Wakefield, um, we were really lucky that the hospital secretary, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ashworth, was really interested in um, collecting treatment, collecting the stories of treatment and the objects. And so he was working at the Stanley Royd Hospital in Wakefield in the 70s and he started collecting all this material and he established the museum. Um, so the collection comes from across the West Riding and in the 1800s there were four West Riding asylums at Wakefield, Menston, Sheffield and Huddersfield. So we've got items from all those um, places including here like some of the um, uniforms that were worn we've got a lot of medical equipment um, we have um, some artwork um, which I'll show, talk to you a bit more about in a minute we've got lots of documentary evidence um, lots of paperwork case records some of which are stored at the archives so it's a really eclectic collection and it presents quite a unique view of mental health and the history of the asylums. So um, some of our objects like this fantastic uh, collection of music we found, the, we were looking through our stores, so part of my job has been to look at what's in store and explore some of this material a bit more thoroughly. So. Part of um, what we've got tells us a bit more about life in the asylum. So this image on, on the left as I'm looking at it um, is some music collections from the church in Wakefield uh, Asylum that was called St Faith's. And there was a huge, uh, huge collection we found the other day of um, material produced for the choir there. Um, and then some of our collection is also more recently put together so this is the the running shoe that we've got from 2002 um, and we're, we're continuing to grow our collection um, and what we're really trying to do is bring people into that story so when the when the, the museum was created in the 70s it was very much part of a, a medical story but in the um, from the 20th century we've started to bring more of the patient stories into that and bring more of an idea of co-creating those stories so we're working with people to bring their perspectives into into the story that the museum represents so what is the museum space and its collection for well as i as i mentioned before around the country a lot of these collections have disappeared they just weren't regarded as an important part of social history and um, psychiatry certainly wasn't regarded as um, important uh, in terms of collecting as other medical professions have, uh, have a history of. So this is quite a unique collection and we needed to ensure that it was protected and developed for the future. But we have lots of other purposes around what we do and um, as I said from from around 2011 the collection was looked at and recreated to the museum that it is today and that has included 
really embedding co-creation into what we do. So we are starting conversations around our objects. We're including people's own interpretation of those objects. And we're hoping to, to by doing that, to challenge some of the stigma associated with mental health and work with people to recover some of those stories that have been lost. In terms of patient work in our collection, we've got quite an interesting um, uh, collection here because we don't have a huge amount of fine art like some, some collections in the country. Um, but as I've, I've sort of illustrated here, there was um, a policy of encouraging patients in the asylum to explore their creative skills. Um, and this is quite an interesting example because I've looked at this many times in the museum and I actually didn't realise initially that it was created by a patient who was just in the records is just known as Mr M. But it's actually a really beautiful um, bird's eye view of Wakefield Asylum, um, which was commissioned by the then medical director. So um, we have got we have got some of these items in our collection. But what we've more more of the material that we hold that might be inspirational to artists today includes things like some of the decorative work, some samplers, some lace work, and some carvings. And we have also got quite a lot of artwork that has been inspired by more recent artists working with the collection. So I'm going to hand over to Maria now, who will talk about how we think about our patient collection um, and talk a little bit more about some of those themes. Is that okay, Maria? Oh. So there we go. Rukiera, um, are you controlling the, the slide? Yes, I, you oh, just yeah. let, let me know when you want me to move on. Um, it's like one of those government press, press things. Right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Maria. I've been working at the Mental Health Museum for about 18 months now on a, a project that was designed to um, raise the profile of the museum and get more involvement from the wider community and service users. And we spent quite a bit of time working with the collection and we had a um, exhibition down in Wakefield One, which I'm guessing you're all familiar with. I think you're all Wakefield people. Um, so I'm just here to talk about some of the objects that Jane's just mentioned. Before I do that, can I just check? I know you're all on mute, but I think I can see you all. If you can just let me know whether any of you have ever been to the Mental Health Museum. No, no one. Anybody? heard of it even if you haven't been to it did you know that there was a mental health music yeah so a couple of people who've, who've heard of it so the museum is up in the grounds of field head hospital for the if that helps to put it in to, so you know where it is so jane's just mentioned some of the objects that we do have and we thought normally a session like this would start with you all coming to the museum and that's where we'd be right now and you'd be having a good look at these things um so in lieu of that we've had to choose some things to show to you um and we thought we'd share with you some of the thoughts and ideas that we'd had about the objects but just to say that these are kind of our thoughts and ideas and some of our language and it's kind of all up for discussion. So if you have different responses, by all means, um, do share those. So if you can just go on to the, the next slide, Jane. There we go. Oh. So we thought it might be interesting to start with thinking about the institution and how the effect that that living in the institution might have on people's ideas about their identity and self-expression and then how they might have responded to that and where we can see that in our collection and the word we've used to talk about that is is control um, and there's a couple of objects there that are, are from 
the were in everyday use in the asylum because there were lots of things around the place that were what these days we call branded we're all very familiar with the idea of brands so the asylum brand was on lots of everyday objects so we have here at the the top right that's the um it's a spoon and a fork and that's engraved with the initials if you can see wra which is the west riding asylum as it was known at that time um over 200 years it's changed its name quite a few times but the wra is for the west riding asylum and at the bottom left there's a brook from some crockery that if you can see is a yorkshire rose um and again that was the emblem that you found on lots of um on the dishes the plates the cups so these were things that were around every day in the dining room and i think this slide's quite interesting if we look at the quotes because these are people's responses who've come into the views into the museum and the things they've had to say about the um about the objects um and the one on the left the person who looked at these things she saw them as as again the branding that the message to the patients was very clear that they were lunatics which was the language used to talk about people with mental health problems uh, when the asylum was first opened and that everything around them was to remind them of that fact because of this of this branding but then interestingly on the right hand side the quote is from someone who clearly well a member of staff in what would have been Stanley Royd, I'm guessing in more recent times. You may all be more familiar with the hospital when it was called Stanley Royd. And when they've looked at these things from the dining room, they've brought back sort of quite happy memories. And they've talked about it bringing back a sense of um, reminding them of community. So the same objects, one person has looked at them and seen institution and not in a good way whereas someone else has looked at them and seen community. So one thing I've, I've found working in the museum over the last 18 months is that, um, yeah, people can have quite different responses to the same objects. So if you want to go on to the next one, Jane. So we wanted to look at how people might have responded to their experience of being in the institution, in the asylum. And I suppose the short answer to that is we don't actually know very much because the thoughts and feelings and experiences of the patients weren't um, recorded or were perhaps paid a lot of attention to. So it's actually quite hard to discern that from written records and so on. Um, and one of the ways we can do that is through some of the creative things that have been left that from, from the early days of the asylum. And in the museum, we're very lucky to have a collection of samplers. We have 10 samplers by one of the patients, Mary Frances Heaton. And again, if you can just ask if any of you have heard of Mary, Mary Frances before now. Just one person, yeah, because she was in the news recently because there's been a blue plaque installed in Wakefield to commemorate uh, Mary and it actually made the national news just um, just before Christmas so you might have come across her um, and she was a patient as it says here in the uh, West Riding Pauper Lunatic Asylum which was the original name for the asylum um, and she came into the asylum in 1837 and she left as I say, we've got 10 of her samplers, but there are others in other museums as well. Um, and she used the opportunity she had for embroidery um, to, she was very um, unhappy about being in the asylum. She didn't agree with the decision to commit her to the asylum. And she used her needle and thread to let everybody know how she felt about that and her objections to that. The, sampler on the right is unusual in that it's more decorative the one on the left is more typical where she's she's kind of used her needle and thread to write in effect so she's she's writing her story it's quite difficult to tell from here the size of them but the one on the right if you can all see me is about that big to be very technical about it 
the one on the left is a much bigger uh, bigger sampler um, with as you can see lots of, of very lots and lots of, of, of very tiny writing that takes quite a lot of time to, to study but this one is interesting because she describes her appearance in the magistrate's court after she, she was arrested and then appeared at the magistrate's court and was committed to the asylum and she's describing that experience here in that sampler and as I understand it that's quite unusual to have a record of those proceedings from the point of view of the person being um, committed and there's a newspaper account of the same thing from the time and it's, it's her account is very accurate the two the newspaper and her account are very very close um there are, she also sewed and she also um painted and wrote as well we know from her records but nothing of that has survived but interestingly her embroidery has and um, as it says there, we know of other examples of, of where a patient story has survived because it's been in embroidery, the textiles. So it's quite interesting that they may have survived where other things, perhaps written, written work didn't. So we have 10 of those samplers that tell a very interesting story. And if we move on, Jane. And then some of the other samples of patient artwork we have come from what was um, seen as an important part of treatment in the early asylum, which was uh, that work basically. So certainly the working class people who were patients in the asylum, they were expected if they were able to work and usually for men in the trade that um, the, that what had been their trade before they were committed to the asylum and the asylum was quite a huge place as we saw from the, the sketch there and it had a farm, a market garden, um, all sorts of workshops where lots of things that were necessary for the asylum from the food that the patients ate to the clothes that they were they wore were made um, on the site and these two uh, artworks here as far as we know were, were um, created by a patient on the right hand side it's a, a mirror and it's a lot bigger than it looks <laughs> there it's quite a big heavy thing and to the left this is a close-up of a lectern that was used in the church and he's actually still in the chapel at Fieldhead Hospital um, so that's quite a big object and the the wings if you like would be where the bible or whatever the person was reading from would have been placed um, and that was in St Faith's the church that we saw on the sketch earlier so to move on to the next one Jane yeah and these are some of the things that were more in keeping with the sorts of activities that women were expected to keep themselves busy with. So it was, there was quite a divide. There was men's work and, and women's work. Um, I think again, it was also a class divide. So the working class women would have found themselves gainfully employed in the laundry and the kitchens. But for women, more genteel women, such as Mary Frances, who we spoke about er earlier, um, they were engaged in in needlework embroidery and here we've got some examples of lace work and in the photograph you can see one of the day rooms from the asylum where you can see some of the examples of the lace work and so on there in the day room right and the next one Jane As well as um, work, another important element of the, the treatment in the early asylum was what came on, what was described as recreation. So again, that was seen as quite important. So there was lots of music, drama. Um, the book there, the music book is from church, so I think the, with lots and lots of, of uh, music from the church but the, the, the 
asylum also had its own theatre from I think 1859 onwards so it had a purpose-built theatre that was one of the finest in the area uh, and it was a big hall that was used for theatre performances, musical performances, uh, dancers, and also was a, um, a dining room. Um, and it had quite a reputation for its, its performances. As far as we know, patients took part in those as audience. They weren't active participants. So the choir, for example, in the church and the drama performances, as far as we know, that was more um, for staff who then performed and the patients were actually more involved as audience rather than active participants in that. And the photograph of a book there is something we found quite recently. That's a fantastic um, thing to look at. Um, and it's just a kind of stream of consciousness in that it's it's just page upon page upon page of almost the reader's portions of sentences, but the language is absolutely fantastic. It's a really, it's a, an amazing read. We're not in quite sure who's the, who is the author of this, and we're just currently researching it. We think it's someone called Joseph Popplewell, who was a patient in the asylum. But we're just trying to find out a little bit more about that. So those are just some of the items we have and as I say some of the thoughts and ideas that came to us that some of the patient artwork is associated with control or protesting against that control, some of the artwork has arisen from ideas the well-being, the ideas of work being good for you, and recreate the benefits of recreation and using some of the, the creative opportunities that they had to um, express themselves. So that's that's it, isn't it? I think I think that's I think. the last one. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks both. Yeah. Um, so now I'm gonna pass over to uh, Tanya Harris who's um, going to just talk a bit more about her um, role in the course and what to expect um, if you're taking part in the course. Thanks, Tanya. Um, hello, everybody. Nice to see faces that I know and faces that I hope to know. Um, I, I think one of the challenges over the last year for um, facilitating a course, working with artists to really understand what they're passionate, interested about, how to share their artwork and their processes but also engage with objects is that the is that we'd love for you to touch and if not touch at least be in the same space to have the resonance of how an object from a collection would feel to you and equally to be in the mental health museum and experience the space and have your take on it so Jane and Maria and Sally um, and I have been talking about that and how much we can collaborate to try and bring some of the some of the images which I mean I think the PowerPoint was beautifully put together thank you so much to the team at, at the hospital um, museum because just seeing for instance the space with the lace work laid out and just imagining um, issues around class and and sex and kind of barriers within barriers and control within control that you've highlighted is 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 a good stimulus to start from. So what we've done as a kind of team is is talked about how the collection is managed, but also what themes have come out in the hope to stimulate discussion, debate, but also encourage artists to think about what parts of the collection or ideas they might be interested in because the because the collection's not completely digitized it's not like you can have a list and go right i want to see this in this way on this day but you might have a particular interest in in the collection as you as it's revealed to you through the curator and through objects that we bring each week and equally because this project is going on over the next year it's an in, exciting in that we've got an intense five weeks in march on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings to work together. 
So we're going to theme each week based on part of the structure of the presentation that we just saw. So start with ideas around control and then look at ideas around protest and how patients and people that were in the museum experienced that. Then look at well-being and expression as themes, as overriding themes. And um, so each Tuesday, there'll be an opportunity for artists to come together for an hour and feedback on what they've been doing and making or ruminating on or researching in between Thursday and that Tuesday. Then there will be an hour of time with Jane, the curator, and with anyone from the team that was available to join us. And then after that, and so that would be focused on objects, focused on the collection and on learning and kind of understanding, the, exploring the collection. And then we would have some stimulus based on that to work with. So we want quite an open structure until we've, we know who's on the course and we know what the interests of those artists are. So on Thursdays, we would have themed arts participation. So it might be activities where we have a visiting artist or someone with a practice that could introduce something to the group. It might be lovely to do some making together, but equally it might be an opportunity then for each of the artists to share what they're working on, what their ideas are, or what processes they want to go through. So in order for this to be as fulfilling as I would, we want it to be for artists, we need to know quite a lot about what the artists are interested in in advance. So it doesn't mean that you know the collection or anything like that, but it might be, well, my practice involves this kind of processes, or I'm particularly interested in these themes in my work, or, or I want to know about this parts of the collection. So that anything that artists know, want to know, we can at least bring to the curatorial team in advance. And, um, and equally, there is this really fantastic opportunity that alongside the course, which will go at a kind of certain amount of momentum to it. So anyone that has participated in a Zoom course with Outside In Online is, there's the, is there, there's the meeting online, and then there's the work that needs to happen outside of those sessions. So research or making or processing so that, so that it's, um, so that you get the most out of it really. And people will work at their different paces. So it might be that at the end of the course, an artist has an idea about a piece of work that's a maquette or a drawing or a sketch or a scaled idea. Or it might be a series of drawings or prints or sculpture or, or text. It could be anything at all. 3D, there's no limit. It could be a sound piece, it could be written. So, but it might be that someone's made that work within those five weeks. And, and completed their research, or it might be they've completed their research, but that they want to propose a piece of work they'd like to make towards submitting for the exhibition in the future. Because we have this opportunity to have an on-site exhibition in 2022 that would go live in March. And so there is some time between when the course ends and when the exhibition is going to be curated when there's an opportunity for further work. So some artists that I've worked with on, on previous courses have wanted to make larger scale work or work on work within their own time and at their own process and that they wanted more time afterwards. So this is one of those courses where the research and the connection with the curatorial team will be done within March, but you could continue to make work if you wanted to afterwards. Does that make, hopefully that makes sense. And then there's the other fantastic opportunity that people on the course might want to go on to take part in a curating course which would be later this year. Hopefully, could be face to face, ideally. And if not, would be a challenge really about how to curate an exhibition through an online course. So that's something we're thinking about. But there's certainly an opportunity for anyone on the course in March to come and visit the museum at a later date when it's safe in terms of COVID restrictions are lifted. So anyone that's on the course would be invited to come into the space to meet the curatorial team, to have an explorer to be on site at some point later in the year. So um, in principle, the plan would be Mondays is exploring the collection, looking at objects, thinking about research themes and encouraging some identify of what research interests the, you as an artist as early on in the course as possible, so we can ask the curatorial team to find objects that relate to your interests. 
because they'll have to go away and they're only on site you know Jane's working one day a week Maria's on site but not on site if they're not allowed you know it's a question of what access have we got and equally there's also an archive that's not within the museum but it might be that you could do further research from the archive and make applications towards that so I don't know I just wanted to say that you know we will really take into account myself and Kate and the course assistant when they come on board because that's another role that's been recruited we'll really take into account the artists that have signed up and what they're interested in and we will design sessions hopefully to suit people and it might be some sessions suit more than others but it's about that collective relationship between everyone on the course and hopefully developing a a kind of friendship with the course and a supportive group so that we'd hope that that group would be positive and would would stay connected over the year ahead towards the exhibition Have, has anyone got any questions is that all right kate to open up to questions yeah let's let's do questions now um just to say i've added in um the information i said i would add to the chat um, so it's just got um, Hannah's email address if you want to book um, an artist support session next Monday or Tuesday. It's also got the link for more information and that's where you can also find the application form. And if you have any other questions um, after today or you'd like to apply in a different format or you'd like the application form in a different format, you can email me, my email address is there or you can give me a call and that's my uh, work mobile number so feel free to call or text that number as well um but yes does anybody have any questions cara hi hi, hi um. hello um, i was just wondering how much reading and writing there's going to be good question so i think it depends on um what your interests are and also that's something that so if 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 writing was difficult it would be possible to feedback verbally or to record sound um and if reading was difficult we would work out access for people to read content if if reading or writing was difficult so i think we'll be very mindful about the access needs of anyone that applies yeah in terms of of, of exploring the collections, we'll, I think we'll look at some key information. For example, um, Maria has mm -hmm. shared with me um, a, a list of, of what criteria was used to, um, that, that people might be submitted to the asylum with, but, uh, which is extraordinary actually. And so, for example, in that, it could lead to further research that people want to do about it and how health and how, how, how health, how women's bodies, how, you know, like if, if you hadn't bled for a while, what that meant, or if you were having a bit of depression or if you had, if your husband was on, I mean, it's quite extraordinary some of the requirements, but we will be looking at what research we can share with you in advance with anyone on the course. It's not that we have essays and dissertations and books that you're required to read but we do want you to investigate and research the collection so that's part of a dialogue i think we'd have with each artist about what they're interested in okay what we have got though is um we have got so many objects um that i really wish i could like show you all of them now i'm so frustrated not to be able to hold them and and you know have an ex material experience with them but we have so many that could prov provide that um stimulation to your artistic creation that if for example you wanted us to we've got lots and lots of photographs we can just image share um to provide that that stimulation around ideas as well so um th there's 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 no limit with that kind of thing we've got some fantastic objects and i'll try and put as many photographs together that we can share share with you so you get a sense of of more of the collection okay great thank you um oh sorry Andrew, do you mind if michelle michelle's just got a hand up so if we go michelle yeah. then i'll come to you angela is yeah. that okay great michelle thanks um it was just kind of leading on actually from what tanya had just been saying it's kind of a two part thing 
and I'm not sure they're entirely questions, but I'll just go for it anyway. So um, in terms of when talking about doing the research, like outside of the sessions, how would we be able to access um, information to research? Will it be provided in advance or will we be able to contact people if, you know, we suddenly in the midst of working on something and like, oh, how do I find out about this information or do we need to wait? For the next session yeah very good that. so why because because the curatorial team are only in, um, because jane's only in one day a week and then sally's in for others we'll have a system i think each week where we we have a, a theme set for the tuesday and the structure and we'll have a a suggestion of what that participatory session on the thursday would be there'll be space each time for people to feedback about what they're researching and interested on and then there'll be a kind of date of request for when you want to submit requests and objects or ideas for that we then I will gather all the artists requests together and submit it to the curatorial team and they'll see what they can come back with with a week after. But we'll have a process because because they're because they're only on site sometimes we have to have a an organized way of doing it. And equally, it might be what an artist wants is in the archive and that might take weeks to get so there might be some online research you can do. There might be, it might stimulate some research about the making of an object or the process that was used. So it depends how you like to research as well. Okay. And is it fine to, this is probably a really silly question, but is it fine to do research outside of the archive as yeah. well? Yeah. Absolutely. I was thinking, Michelle, when you asked that question, it, it, of um, possibly trying to get together a list of potential um, online places that we, we know about that would be good ports of call if you're working and you just want to go and find something out instantly like that because you, yeah. you know, you're really inspired. So I'll put that on my, um, my list of things to think about because there are a lot of places you can find. For example, the Welcome Collection in in London has got a lot of online images that might provide a little bit of extra background to your particular theme where you're going. So we could put a list of those sort of sources together, which will help in the sort of in between the sessions, I think, hopefully. That would be great. And it, this is just a tiny thing and it's rela related to the not being able to obviously see the collections. A lot of what I'm interested in is the um, the textiles and particularly the Mary Heaton samplers. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered sort of like what kind of detail the you know there is available of the actual samplers themselves because obviously I've seen the photos that you shared, but they're quite yeah. <laughs> We've got transcriptions of all of them, so right. you can see see what she's written and, and close up images of some Brilliant. of the, the, the stitch work as well. All right, thank you. Sorry for all the questions. No, no. And especially to Angela who was waiting as well. Um, it's um, Michelle, you're, you're, um, Maria and I've been talking about if, if we can have larger, larger images sizes so we can zoom in and look at close-ups of areas of objects that we'd like. And also if there's an opportunity to see the object within the curatorial team's hands or to see it in situ if they are back on site to see where it is housed or how that room looks or yeah so those are really good questions you're asking brilliant thank you so much everyone Thanks, Michelle. Um, I'm just going to add quickly there as well. Um, even though this course is going to be online, we have got some money in the budget for travel. So we're hoping that at some point when the world is an easier place to navigate, um, we can offer that um, to people who do want to come for a visit. And it might be that they can, you can come at a time that's, um, suit, you know, works for you. Um, it could be as a group or it could be individually. Um, but just so that you, it will, it will be probably after the course, but just so you know that there is going to be an opportunity there for you to actually go and see the museum and, and the works in the collection at some point as well, because I know that's so important. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I love of, that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks, Angela, for your patience. What, what's your All question? Right. Um, no, it was really interesting hearing what Michelle was asking. And kind of following on from that was... Um, and what you just said, Jane, um, was I was thinking like obviously some of these, some of the items are 
three D, and I was wondering whether you could sort of maybe video them, sort of you mm. know, almost on a turntable or something, so you can actually see. Yeah, but that's a, that, that's a really good point, Angela, and that that does remind me that I had thought about that, and the thought had slipped from my head as it does um, previously. So, what we will try and do is get some. For example, there's um. I was thinking about this um, weighted locked boot that we have and how perfect that would be to take a, a little video of so you get a sense of it and the sort of uh, yes. the 3D aspect of it. So yes, we'll try and do some little little videos of things yeah. like that. I mean, it's possible that we will be able to deliver some of the sessions from in the museum in March. Anyway, fingers crossed so that you'll be able to see see us being holding them and exploring them with you on screen it should get more context as well if it's next to something else as well because yeah, it's hard absolutely. sometimes to you know you say it's this big but it's yeah. like getting that context <laughs> yeah isn't it? does it fit yeah. in someone's hand or is it something huge or whatever as well yes so that would yeah. be that'd be cool and the other thing that i i do know of when um you were speaking at first you said we have a lot of documentation and sort of case case notes and things and I wonder obviously there's confidentiality and things like that to take into consideration but how available that archive is or what those sort of things are. Well I just wonder if Sally might be able to just contribute on that um because she uh she's an expert in such matters because she used to work yeah. in the archive so I'm just um, starting my video. Just <laughs> she's coming on. She's coming on. Uh, I always that. turn to Sally when there's an archive question. Uh, she's my can, expert. Can you see me and hear me? We can hear you. We can't see you. All oh, right. Okay. I think I've hold on. Can you see me? There she is. <laughs> um, so I started in July at the Mental Health Museum as a museum assistant, and prior to that. I've worked at the West Yorkshire Archive Service since 2007. So um, the Stanley Roy collection, RC85, is one of the largest collections that's held over at the archives. Um, it's an internationally important collection because it's so comprehensive. Um, it was actually added to UNESCO World Memory um, Register a few years ago. So anything if anyone is interested in delving into the archives there is so much administration and so much patient records that are available but obviously at the moment not immediately available um a lot of the female case notes used to be on a website called her story mm -hmm. history to her story which was hosted by um huddersfield university but unfortunately that site is down so as far as i'm aware images aren't available online at the moment so you would need to contact um West Yorkshire Archive Service direct with any inquiries and staff aren't on site there regularly at the moment so there will be an inevitable delay with things and obviously there is also the confidentiality issue so as a rule um, at the archives we have to work on a closure period of 100 years from the date of death of the patient so even if someone was in the asylum in 1910 if they didn't die till 1935 their records wouldn't be available for for another 15 years so sometimes it can be quite a long process you may just have a name which means looking through admission registers and then trying to find if there are any relevant case notes available um, but if you do find somebody who has got four case notes there's so much information available in there and from the 1880s onwards, often a photograph as well. So they, they are wonderful records. And hopefully <laughs> things will have opened up a bit by March, won't they? We will. I don't know. I don't think that they're working on any, on, on, on the basis that they're going to be open yeah. um, every day until, until I think at least March. So it might be while this course is on, they're only going to be open two days a week, which. No, it's really useful information booking. though, Sally. Yeah just to know yeah. that, that that is there. I mean, that's amazing. There, that there is an online catalogue where you can look at the catalogue online. So if you Google West Yorkshire Archive Service and look at um, our collection tab, there's a link to the catalogue that'll open up and things are listed in there, two item levels. So you'll be able to see exactly what annual reports there are for certain years. 
what records there are for the tailor's shop, um, you know, what records there are of the farm. So you will get a lot of information there, but you just won't actually be able to see inside the records. That would yeah. either be um, paying for copies or making an appointment when they are able to open up. Sally, no, thank you. Sorry, sorry, Sally, can you just repeat um, that archive? Um, you go into West, what, what was it called? It's West Yorkshire Archive Service, if you Google that. Oh, West, West Yorkshire, right, okay. And then yeah, look at West the Our Collections tab. Okay, Collections tab. And then there's a link to the catalogue there. Okay, link to the catalogue. Brilliant, thank you. That's really helpful. I, think I have one very, very quick, 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 quick question. Um, depending on where we are with um, current circumstances and lockdown, come um, March when you, you will be um, conducting some of the um, days in the um, museum um, and we, you know, as, as participants, people will be um, online watching that. Is there, do you think there might be a possibility that um, people could also be invited to go to the museum whilst um, a session takes place in March? We, we, we're planning an online course in March. We don't know whether or not the site will be <laughs> at all. So we would, I think later in the year, there is a second course where we're hoping it would be face to face. But I don't think in March we're planning to have some on site and some not because we can't plan for that because everything's on lockdown and we're still in tier four so it mm. it would be a it would be an online course with an opportunity to visit when it's open i think if we, yeah you. if we stick to the, the the course being delivered online if there of course becomes an opportunity um then we would we would look into that really carefully and and do all the relevant risk assessments and everything. It's just uh, as Tanya says, it's just so hard to predict at the moment where we'll, where we'll be. Yeah. Um, but does that mean that if one wants to visit the museum um, and we're not in tier four, that that might be a possibility at all? Not necessarily during the um, course sessions, but just as a kind of... I think there's another layer of complication because it's actually on, an, on a hospital site. So they've had quite strict rules irrespective of tears and so on about members of the public on the site. So it's, it's slightly more complicated because of where the museum is. Yeah, and I think, I think it's like... probably unlikely in the near future just because of, of where it is. Yeah and I think as I just mentioned before at some point in the future there will be that possibility for us to cover travel costs for people to visit but that will be um, probably not at, not during the course but at some point you know later on in this year when it's more possible. Um, but yeah. Angela are you yeah, um, I just you pick it upon I think Tanya said or someone said that Will you be do, repeating this course later in the year if someone wasn't successful this time round or? Yeah, so yeah, that's the plan. So we've got two exploring collections courses for each venue. Um, and the idea is obviously we wanted them both to be face to face courses, but um, it hasn't been possible. Um, so we're hoping that this one will be online and hope and the next one perhaps could be face-to-face -face or a mixture of face-to-face -face and online for maybe people who are more vulnerable um, and also to make it a bit more accessible for people as well. Um, we're just looking into ways that we might be able to do that. Um, but yes, the idea is that we'll have another of these courses in, um, we're looking at either summer or early autumn for those, depending on how we... Yeah, no, no, it's just good, good to sort of know, isn't it? I think yeah. it's a lovely opportunity just to, Obviously, everything's online at the moment. So, yeah. but to actually, obviously, different museums have different things online, and to actually maybe see one of one of you, yourselves, you know, saying, "Yes, we've got this out of the drawer. It's not normally on public display, but here it is." I mean, that's in itself quite fabulous, you know. At the moment, um, yeah, that's quite nice to 
Yeah, to, yeah. I'd like to see X, please. But someone, yeah. I would physically get that out for you because that doesn't always happen if you go to the museum anyway, does it? You know, no, you see what's on display. It is a privilege to just get to work with the curatorial team in this way, yeah. and and, yeah. and to have the intimate group of being able to express what people want and have that feedback on in much bigger collections and with bigger curatorial teams it can be very complicated to run an exploring collections course on site and have access to view the archive might not be on site the store might not be on site it might be restricted to a certain section a day so there are a lot of benefits to this particular course that we have this contact and relationship with Jane with Maria and with Sally and also that we can make requests and tailor it for the artists that come on the course so even if we were there on site, the museum's open at certain times that, you know, some of the objects, some of the research in the archives wouldn't be on site anyway. So there are, and also in terms of access. So we can, we definitely want this to be positive. So not, a, you know, we're looking at how can we make this course special online? Not what can we do because we can't be on site. It's definitely like, well, how can we make this a, a very outside in related course? Yeah. I just wanted to say one thing, I can see Michelle's hands up. So we have some budget in terms of art materials that depending on what people want to, what, want to do or what they need to access. So just like I know Sally mentioned, there might be a cost to copies, to get copies from the archives. That's something we can talk to outside in about. If it's copies to get research and a budget, I'm sure we can talk to outside in about it. And if it's art materials that you don't have at home, that you're interested in using for your exploring collections work that we can send in advance. Those are the kind of conversations we can have with each artist, depending on what they want. So that's something that we would like to plan and prepare for before the call starts. So that if someone's like, well, for instance, me, I'm not, I, I don't embroider all. So I'm not a textiles artist. So if I'm on a course where we're inviting someone in to do some embroidery and sewing, or if people want to do it, I'd certainly need some kit because I haven't got, I've got like, you know, so you understand. So, so it might be, oh, well, we'd like to try this out for an activity, but equally it might be, well, I really want to work. I'm interested in working with this process, but I haven't got anything to do it. So that's something you can consider when you're applying or at interview at the meeting rather than the interview, the conversation. Mm. Um, Michelle, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say, for me, as, as um, because I have to shield and um, even when we're not in a pandemic, I kind of have to keep it um, arm's length from people's because um, of my um, autoimmune condition. That first of all, being able to do stuff online is an incredible opportunity for people like me who miss out on a lot of stuff that's where there's groups of people in a place and it's just not really accessible to us um, but also I wondered if there are the two courses if it's worth maybe mentioning something along those lines in the application that uh, online course might actually be better suited to someone's access needs yeah I think definitely um, Michelle and, and from our I think a lot of organizations have learned this lesson during the pandemic is that um, there are a lot of people who um, even under much more normal circumstances, aren't able to leave their house as regularly as um, they might want to um, and aren't able to uh, travel using public transport, all that kind of stuff. So I think it's really important that um, we, you know, we're very aware that um, having an online course is, um, is, is like, is really good for a lot of people. And so we, we would like people to you know make that clear in your application if that is something that you know you wouldn't be able to do if it wasn't online i think do put that in your application um and also thinking about moving forwards with our kind of courses and the events we run as well we are looking at ways to incorporate um like a an online element to face-to-face -to -face events that we run in the future as well so we know obviously we know how important it is for people to be able to access things um, remotely as well and so we're hoping we can take some of what we've learned during this time into the work we do going forwards yeah that's great i mean obviously it's not just people with autoimmune conditions yeah. we have fatigue issues yeah mine might be the difference between them being able to attend and not because the travel 
of going yeah. somewhere might be too overwhelming. So it's really, it's really great um, that it's creating more access. On the flip side of, yeah, you can't go and actually see the collections and stuff, but yeah. Yeah, Thank you. yeah, definitely. And um, I mean, particularly our work with collections, which, and collections are kind of, have traditionally been very, you know, you have to go and see them and touch them. And obviously that's a really, you know, a really nice part of accessing a collection, but we're trying to think of ways that that can be done remotely as well. So um, yeah, just, just to let you know, we are considering that. And the other thing that we haven't said is yet, but is on it is there is mentoring um, time built into the course for artists to have one to one mentoring to discuss their research, their practice, what they're trying to do on the course, any any conversations they want to have privately. And that would be probably um, every fortnight. So it would be two sessions during the course and then one afterwards. So it could be um up to an hour on it might i think it depends on what people want but i certainly would say by week two we would offer mentoring week two probably week four and then after the course is finished if it's to do with supporting someone who might be continuing their work or reflecting on where they are how they might engage next so and, and that that can be time to suit the artists and their availability and what else they've got on during the week in between the two dates on the course. Uh, any other questions? This isn't the last chance to ask questions, obviously. If there's anything you think of after the session today, you can email me. My um, email address is in the chat um, and also my um, telephone number as well. Um, so yeah, if you start doing the application and you, and you have more questions, then you can get in touch. And also, if you do need um, support or some advice filling in your application form, do um, book in for one of those artist support sessions early next week um, and there'll be someone who um, can help you do that. Um, it might be that, that you know, someone else that is also interested, would be interested in the course. I think because the, the timeline is quite close, if anyone hasn't come today but you think, actually, I know an artist who might meet the criteria and be really interested in this feel free to reach out and encourage them to do it as well because we want to have this opportunity for people to do and and as you know there's another course that'd be good to you know good to welcome as many artists as possible great brilliant okay well um thank you all so much for coming today thank you to both the bsl interpreters Thank you, Jane, Maria, Sally, Tanya, for presenting. Thank um, you. And yeah, looking forward to seeing your applications, if you're still interested. Nice yeah. to meet you all. Lovely okay, to see you all. You. Enjoy thank the rest of the day. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so yeah, much. have a good day. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Hope you join the course. <laughs>